Hi everyone um, and welcome to the virtual launch. Uh, this is an exciting time for the studio and uh, it's great to be part of the launch. For those of you who are a little unsure as to who I am, uh, my name is Alan and I am chair at Nottingham Writers Studio. I haven't met all of you people yet and look forward to the opportunity of doing that and the uh, virus kind of got in the way of all that. So the COVID thing has been a, a, an awful thing that's affected so many people's lives. Uh, my heart goes out to single parents who are living in small apartments and, and generally to all families who've got young children who've had to get through weeks and weeks and weeks of uh, staying safe and uh, it's not easy. Also to people who live alone. I think the, the mental pressure on people who live alone can be very difficult. Um, I live alone. Um, I've been lucky because I've got people who I speak to regularly online. But at the end of the day, I still finish up with a haircut like this. So it's not really that good, is it? I want to thank a few people because um, the concept of this and the idea behind it um, is, is a tremendous idea. But the standard of, uh, of submissions that we've had that we've put into this magazine have been so high. Um, I've read them. I find them uh, touching, at times very, very emotional. And uh, I, I thank everybody who's contributed towards it. Special thanks must go to Tom and Sophie. They, uh, in my time as chair, they've been fantastic. They work so hard uh, in putting things together. Their normal job takes them all their time. And now this has been additional to that. So I, I thank them for all the work that they put in. I also thank Zena for the illustrations. Uh, they, they look really, really good. And also to uh, Ben next door at Carousel and Dizzy Inc uh, for their work in helping us put the thing together and, and with layouts etc and also for the work that they will be doing printing for us thank you again and uh, that's my bit done for the for the uh, launch and now i hand you over to other people for their contributions thank you again Outside my high, wide window, a slapdash splash of tender petal pink spreads across a pool of velvet blue. Another day is closing. I watch it safe within my fortress. It will not keep out the sky. After the year of washing hands, when all the dead had finally been buried, my daughter began to talk to crows. The birds arrived just after the quarantine, as we were being allowed out from our houses, blown in by the first snows of the new year. Taking up residence in the gnarled old orchard at the end of our garden, these corvids seemed of a particularly large variety. They numbered two, maybe three dozen, heavy and black as pitch, all beak and shiny feathers, stark against the snow-cloud sky. My daughter, not yet quite seven, took to them straight away, heading out to their new station on the day they arrived and, despite the cold, returning to her duty each day. She would stand there, below the bare trees, and chatter away in her tiny beautiful sing-song voice, which, in the snow-shrouded stillness, carried on through the midwinter silence. At first it was just a quirky oddity, one of those strange unknowable things that a child does for a day or two and then discards and forgets. Who can really remember how it was to be so young and lost in wonder of the ways of the natural world? As the new year wore on though, and the days became weeks, we found that the raspy repetitive core core of the crows responding calls became the background to our days. It certainly became a talking point in the village. Needless to say, we asked her what the crows were saying, and, although she attempted to explain, the truth be told, she was old enough to understand the question. We were simply too old to understand the answer. By February, the other villagers had started to mutter about bad omens and harbingers of death. And who would not think such a thing in these dismal times, when harvests cannot be collected for the lack of the living, and bitter, grief-scarred men fight in the streets. 
Naturally, we called in the priest. He was a gentle but firm man who quizzed my daughter at length. His conclusions were simple. This is childish nonsense and we can all be assured that the evil has indeed passed. We have been spared by providence, as good folk always will be. And yet, by March, as the hours of crow talk continued, I started to notice something new. That below the endless core core, one could discern other notes, clicks, rattles, lispings, and even the tinkle of bells. Slowly, as my acquaintance with sleep lessened, I became convinced that whatever these birds were telling my daughter was the most important thing in the world. And so now, as spring tiptoes in, I find I end my days bleakly standing by the back kitchen door, chewing my nails to the quick, watching, as my daughter stands in the orchard conversing with that black, ululating crowd of beaks that only she can understand. And I know fear again. Today's walk is the work of a lifetime. Years of practice have built up to this, a two by two parade with all manner of colorful creatures, strutting humans hiding their faces as they weave along paths, grass verges, into woods, seeking out places that were secret. The locality has become our world, to be explored with greater tenderness than we kept for holidays abroad. We are learning to treasure what we have within an hour's walk. Whether the golden cowslip primrose, forget-me-nots of home pier point, or the blackened cormorant hanging out its wings, Perhaps we will glimpse a lesser spotted woodpecker. Even the sight of Robin Redbreast is enough to lift our spirits. All around life is thriving. The water willow shows its softer side, white fluffy blooms. Red Campion turns its eye upward to our faces. These old friends have not wavered patiently waiting for us to notice them, to take the time without distractions. Here, under the iron gaze of Albert Einstein, we ask nature for some answers. Wisely, it asks us to keep looking. Thursday, we pawed from our homes, paused on our doorsteps, poised to proclaim our support with our hands. Primed by the media, by fear-laden gratitude and government briefings, in common cause with our neighbours, albeit socially distanced, in our separate booths, we picked up our pens. We marked our crosses for the party that promised to purge dear Blighty of the hydra-headed virus, the scourge of socialism, the menace of immigration, the pox of progressive taxation and constraints on capital, the hindrance of health and safety human rights, the plague of healthcare, free at the point of delivery for all. It's Monday and we gaze down from our tower in the sea. Below us, seagulls fight in the wind, toss for yards, they flap frantically and then drift sedately falling the wind into false victory before relaunching their attack with a battle cry. 
We watched dusk creep across the epic grey sea an inch towards the little town. As lights flicker on, we imagine it as, as a stage, its stories about to unfold, and how we wish we were there instead of here, at the wrong end of the spotlight. On Tuesday, sirens howl at the broken sky, and we listen for the thrum of, war, of the war machines. We huddle in the ready-made grave that Father dug in the garden, only an arch of corrugated steel between us and oblivion. Out beyond the potato patch and above the garden fence, a tapestry of searchlights illuminates the clouds which glow silvery and white against the midnight sky. Then a boom too near and our whole world shakes. Breath withheld and knuckles white, we grip hands with our parents who encloses in a soft, warm, trembling cocoon. Danger eases. We peek again and see the runner beans and tomatoes illuminated by an ominous orange glow. It's Wednesday and we're Major Tom, reclined and waiting for launch. Spacesuits donned, helmets locked, we twist dials and flick switches, American countdowns, press, flash cam press camera flashes, ecstatic cheers and blast off. Through the pothole the world falls away, all greens and blues and swirly wispy whites, smaller and smaller from beach ball to ping pong ball and then, and then nothing. Weightlessness and silence, beyond our tin can space is, a no is not a thing, it's a no thing, an eternity of nothing. Once we thought the cosmos, sh all shining silvery stars and inky black, but now we know that black is not a colour, but an absence, a void. Thursday, humanity draws its final breath from underground we watch. We hide, we wait, we grow. We are the children of the apocalypse. Up above, with drones and bots, we spy on your demise. We watch as green reclaims it all, its vengeance nearly complete. Its tendrils twist and wind and grasp, pulling down your houses, towers and bridges. It smothers your tarma, eats your art, kills your dreams and buries your memories. Maybe we will rise again. Maybe we should not. It's Friday and we don't want to play. We hate each other and sit at opposite ends of the windows sill, watching the empty street in angry silence. No one's out to play. No balls, no bikes, no skipping ropes. The sun beats down and cleanses it all. It bleaches and freshens, but it cannot wash this pestilence away. How long must we wait? When can we see our friends? Even school seems a distant paradise. Soon it will pass, leaving us caught in a historical moment that flies in amber. But for now, a day seems like a lifetime here in isolation. Will our paths cross again when all of this is over? Or are you lost to me once more, like a ghost who manifests momentarily before vanishing beyond my reach, knowing I can never follow? I owe you nothing and you, you have made yourself painfully clear in the intervening years that my presence in your world is unrequired yet in my absence haunt me still by seeking news from all the old places and my soul my soul cries out in anguish because I am no longer there This is called The Trees. It was written in May this year, during the lockdown, of course, and it was inspired partly by the trees near where I live. 
but it also quotes from Philip Larkin's poem, The Trees, which I've known for a long time, but which seemed especially relevant this spring. I'm just going to read the first half. Outside my window, a garden. Beyond, residential streets, their flower beds and trees full of spring. A little further, over the road, a park. The trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. Beyond that, not yet attainable by me, buses, shops. Then a city, a country, a world still partly in lockdown. Outside my mind's window, there is kindness, generosity, consideration. Beyond that, brave medical and social care. Further, national incompetence and mismanagement, international failures, and beyond, all the dead and the bereaved, the sick, the isolated, the bankrupt. This spring has been so beautiful for so long that it has caused me to wonder if the natural world in the shape of a minute virus, is taking its own revenge on us for our decades-long misuse of the environment. Perhaps the season is mocking us and our difficulties, showing us that whatever we do, nature left alone is best. We should all stay at home. The fewer of us that are outside, the better. But in my state of heightened sensibility at this time, the trees in the nearby streets have seemed to reach out above the road, above our heads. Their leaves and branches, a green cathedral vault, to give us shelter and quiet, touching, surrounding, shielding. This is a poem I wrote called A Day Called Night and I wrote it on the equinox in the early stages of lockdown on what turned out to be a very cold day. Out there a feeble sun is trying to shine or maybe the clouds are trying to prevent it. Be as it may, right now I have little inclination for nuance or equivocation. This cold northeasterly warns me against previous optimism and I turn up the heating a notch. In here, the long day is all mine. Out there even the flowers look cold, shivering or is it dancing, trying to keep warm? Either way, right now I see no reason for me to venture outside to look and see. While spring remains stubbornly coiled and summer holds no fair promise of release, a bleak or winter now empties the streets, laying low the vulnerable and the old. Out there, the equinox. New hope, new light, a time to sing and to dance away the dark, so they say. Right now, it's hard to believe that winter's blast will ever leave. As the clocks step forward, so we step back, back into the shadows, down like moles, hide away in our safe dark holes, eschew the day and its airy delights. Out there, masked faces tense into the wind, present tense, future tense, who can say? Right now, all that each of us can do is to carry on each day anew. Amid the bloat and the bumble from on high, the sad lives laid waste in the quest for life, the fear behind the mirror's eyes, we muster what reassurance we can find. Human touch, a kiss, a hug, a handshake. 
It's our first form of communication, something we rarely think about. The feeling of your hand in mine. It connects us in times of celebration and happiness. It comforts us in times of sadness and fear. Our bodies crave it. The connection, the security, the comfort. Touch has power. The power to kill. One touch for the price of hundreds of lives. It sounds surreal, I know. Like something pulled straight from the pages of a sci-fi novel. The girl with the lethal touch. A made-up story. A nightmare. A fantasy book. It will never happen to us. It will never happen to me. But here I am. Listening to the clock tick and watching the dust settle on the street outside my bedroom window. I'm not scared of catching the coronavirus. I'm scared of spreading it. Is one hug worth the potential risk of losing someone? Do I unknowingly cradle the monster in my hands? That's why we're in lockdown. To protect ourselves from each other. One by one, the theatres, the shops, the schools, the restaurants all go dark. And we are left in isolation. Cut off from physical connection. Human touch. But we are not alone. I race down the stairs as the clock ticks a little louder and my blood rushes with anticipation. What if no one is out there? I banish the thought from my mind. My hands clamp around the door knob feels electric. Like I'm holding onto forbidden fruit. Like I'm inviting in the monster which lurks outside. When did that happen? When did the world become a monster and we shrank to become its prey? The clock chimes eight and I fill my lungs with air, thankful that I can still afford that luxury. I throw the door open and a waves of shouts and screams explode into the night. A smile burns across my lips and my hands clap with theirs, like a heart beating together, sending one clear message into the world. We are in this together and we will not be defeated. A big iron gate at the entrance to the allotment leads to a wide green lane. We walk along it to the end. The plots are clearly demarcated, each with its own entrance. They combine order and disorder, neat vegetable beds and overgrown corners, compost heaps and sheds in various states of repair. At the end of the lane we turn right. To our left is a hawthorn hedge, full of late blossom. A path has been mown down the lane, leaving a border wild with dandelions, buttercups, nettles, brambles, forget-me-nots, green alkanet. Our battered wooden door stands in a wooden frame with a door handle that you might find inside a house and a bolt with no lock. On the left, a six foot high hedge, on the right, a slatted fence. Once inside, I am in a magical place. We hear the dull rumble of traffic, less obtrusive than usual. We are shielded by two rows of hedges. A few bars of loud music from a car stopped at the lights. The voices of passing pedestrians. Fragmentary conversations drift across our plot. Bird song. In this place, I'm removed from the rest of my life. I have no responsibilities. I am a worker. I am not nurturing. I am focused on destruction. Bindweed, Convolvulus arvensis. A common and often troublesome weed, a perennial with a creeping rootstock that branches for many feet underground, taking possession of much soil. At the turn of the year, the plot was overgrown with thick brambles and tall grass. Piles of old carpet, disintegrating tarpaulins and bits of dismantled sheds littered the ground. Once we started to dig, we unearthed glass, 
rusty nails and the bones of long dead goats. And bindweed, its thick roots invading everywhere. Even when we dug a bed twice, we always found more. It is spring. We have planted a bed with garlic, onions and potatoes. Bindweed is sprouting up. If we allow it to grow, it will entwine the crops, engulfing them. I weed. The roots are brittle and can regrow from a tiny piece left in the soil. They send up white shoots that turn purple as they near the surface. The first leaves are this colour until they unfurl. I weed. Roots emerge from under the paving sad path and the mouldering carpet under the hedge. Deep roots go beyond the reach of my trowel, breaking off as I try to dislodge them. I mistake a curled up worm for a root and I'm surprised when it moves. I weed. My weekly campaign will subdue the bindweed but not destroy it. Deep in the soils, roots persist. Root in the soil, roots persist, ready to throw up shoots next year. Next spring, I'll be here to weed again, forever occupied, forever purposeful. I'd never lost a parent before. I was new to this game. My wife had lost both. How careless, an old joke says. Of course, the opposite is true. Her grief is more established, tucked away, cherished. I can follow in her path, grateful her experience makes my steps steadier, surer, less prone to stumbling in the dark. My dad last spoke to me in the early hours of Friday the 28th of February. I arrived at the hospice late, a happy accident meaning I could be alone with him. The truth was I'm the kind of idiot who packs too much into their life and had been held up elsewhere. I took the bottle of single malt he'd given me up in Skye in December a lifetime ago. I hadn't seen him in a week and thought we might finish the bottle together. One look told me that wasn't going to happen. He told me two things. First, that he was dying. We both knew it, but it was the first time he'd said it. He'd always talked of a cure or of a mistake being made, but now he admitted the stark truth. I responded by lying to him. You'll be all right, I said. Then he told me he loved me, and I said I loved him too, and I'd see him later. Nice to finish with the truth. These were the last words he spoke to anyone. My sister later told me he was waiting for me. See idiot reference above. He didn't die until later that day. We were with him. We used his bed as a picnic table. He'd wanted one more family meal. I read him the story his granddaughter had written for BBC's 500 Words. How everyone around us enjoyed it. The nurses said Dad would have loved it. He'd have heard every word. Mundane moments, knocked against surreal ones. I went out for fish and chips. My sisters and me were eating them with our fingers in the lounge. Dad was moved into a quieter ward. The nurses were making preparations. I was watching snooker with another patient when my sister came to say the nurses said we should tell him it's time to let go. We did, and he died five minutes later. There was humour, my sister changing her mind and telling him to come back, and there was peace. The nurses laid him out with a flower by his side, poured us a drink, whiskey for me, and left us alone. We passed the news to those we loved, and time moved on. When my wife lost her parents, she said the strangest thing was how life did carry on. How she'd look at strangers and think they were doing normal things, like getting on a bus and going to work. Didn't they know she'd lost a parent? Well now, a global pandemic was boiling over, and everybody was about to forget what normal was. Dad was always going to die, and his prognosis was brief and terminal. That he went when he did, allowing us time to celebrate his happy life, was a true blessing. On the 11th of March, we came together. Everyone who loved him laughed, hugged and cried. We had no idea about distancing then, but we were about to learn. His passing tightened old bonds, and as we retreated to our homes, physical distancing occurred, but social distancing did not. 
We are unisolated, more connected than we knew. Life in lockdown, eh? It's an international crisis. A pandemic like no other. So we're all trapped in our houses and I can't visit me mother. Me nan's gone into lockdown. She's vulnerable, you see. But she's not quite got the message. She keeps inviting me for tea. And my sister's in her element. Her day's spent on her phone. She started sending TikToks and she won't leave me alone. I've not heard from me father. That's nothing to fear. If I didn't have to work, I doubt he'd leave the house all year. My friends have got creative, playing quizzes on an app. They're all linked up on video with babies on the lap. And it sent the missus crazy. Screams she wants it all to end. Not been in the car for weeks, but says I drive around the bend. And there's some still out there working, like my auntie who's a nurse. And we all agree they're heroes, because they're putting others first. So I'm counting myself lucky, just glad to be alive. And I get to see my neighbours every Thursday from the drive. Where's John? She's already sensing my father's absence. He'll be back soon, I lie. Time means nothing to my mother now. She squints at the newspaper headlines. Where's John? He's gone to Mike's. He'll be back later. She lifts out a pull-out section and stares at the pictures. Where's John? It's like she suspects me of spiriting him away. Dad's only been gone an hour. I pull out a book of poems I remember from childhood and start to read. Is there anybody there? said the traveller. Knocking on the moonlit door, my mother joins in, some distant light illuminating her face. Then she trails off and I finish the poem alone. She moves around the room inspecting ornaments as if for the first time. I watch, my innards twisted. How did someone so cultured, so intelligent, become like this? She claws at her cardigan, discarding it on the floor, then pulls on Dad's jumper. It dwarfs her tiny frame, giving her an urchin look. It leaves me wondering, when exactly did she shrink? Where's John? This is exhausting, like minding a small child, but without the promise. She starts to set the table, laying places for eight people. Expecting company, I ask, laughing. She laughs too without knowing why. For a few moments we laugh together. I go to the bedroom that was mine and drag out a box containing old friends. There's Marvin the gorilla, Sal with the missing eye, Big Ted and Jeremy the life-size rag doll. They'll do as dinner guests. Look who's come to lunch, Mum. She smiles and helps me seat them round the table. I message my husband but there's no signal. I have to go outside. On the drive, I bumped into the neighbour, Mr Williams. Everything all right with your mother? Fine, thanks. He turns to go, but something in me screams. Don't go. I need to talk to a sane human being. Would you like a cup of tea? Mr Williams accepts. And if he finds it odd to see dolls and bears sitting around the table, he's too polite to comment. They become like children, I say, as if the dolls were mum's idea. You've hit on something there, he says. People with Alzheimer's need to play. My mother softens in his presence. Her, her face relaxes into smiles. I came to a few parties here years ago. Since your mother's illness, your father keeps himself to himself. True. Dad's become a recluse. He fears the world outside. Mr Williams turns to the piano. Who plays? Mum used to. Do you play? A little. He runs his fingertip over the wooden surface, leaving a fine line in the dust. I open the lid. Give us a song. He bangs out a few tunes, singing a rich Welsh tenor. My mother accompanies him in her bird-like voice. Her eyes are bright now, and there's a flush in her cheeks.
The world outside is strange. The outside world is strange. The strange world is outside. The world is strange outside. Inside, all is well as usual. Inside, all is well. Inside, all is as usual. Inside, well, as usual. Inside is all. Except that things are different outside. Except that things are different inside. Except that things are different. Except that different is the thing. Except there are no exceptions. Except every different day outside. Except every different day inside. The outside world is calm. The outside world seeks. The outside world seeks. The outside world seeks the calm the inside world offers. Inside world seeks. The inside world seeks. The inside world seeks the calm the outside world can offer. Inside can learn from the difference outside. Outside can learn from the difference inside. Inside. We learn the difference outside. Outside. We learn the difference inside. We learn the difference of outside, inside. And we learn the difference, and we learn the inside difference outside. Except nothing is different. Except the differences. Days lengthen, fuse, overextend themselves and outstay their welcome. The future vanishes. Still, new rhythms emerge. Breakfast with birdsong, postprandial walks through streets full of rainbow-clad windows, evenings watching that magnificent performer, the setting sun. Zoom chats, emails, work, echoes of a past life fill the daylight hours, until the dark of night whispers, come into my sleep-warm arms, I have important things to show you. <laughs>